sermon is from 1 Kings chapter 8, starting at verse 14. This takes place in the account of the dedication of the new temple that King Solomon had built in Jerusalem. Then the king turned around and blessed all the assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel stood. He said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who with his hand has fulfilled what he promised with his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I have not chosen a city from any of the tribes of Israel in which to build a house, that my name might be there. Nor did I choose anyone to be a ruler over my people Israel, but I have chosen Jerusalem in order that my name may be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. My father David had it in mind to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, You did well to consider building a house for my name. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son who shall be born to you shall build the house for my name. Now the Lord has fulfilled the promise that he made, for I have risen in the place of my father David. I sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised and have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have provided a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our ancestors when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. May God bless this reading of the word. As a child growing up in California, I used to love to visit my grandparents on their small farm in the San Joaquin Valley. Scattered around that farm were various old farm implements, which all seemed so strange and exotic to me as a city boy. And I could sit on some of them and pretend to operate them. And in one corner of that property was a grove of bamboo what seemed like an exotic forest in which my cousins and I would play. Often when Grandpa was about to feed the chickens, he would fill his wheelbarrow with chicken feed and let me take a ride sitting in the midst of the chicken feed. And in the corner of the yard around the farmhouse was a small pond which I fell into once when I was very little. And in the summer months, we would sleep on the screened-in back porch. Coming from the city, I always noticed that there was no sidewalk anywhere near the farm. How strange that was, I thought. And the air smelled differently, too. The farm seemed so large and somewhat mysterious when I was small. As the years passed, Grandpa and Grandma sold the farm and they moved into the nearby town and retired. Years later, as an adult, I found my way back for another glimpse of that farm. Both the house and the land seemed to have shrunk in size over the years. When I think about how we carry the past, our past within us, I remember my grandparents' farm. That farm where my mother grew up was not just a place to visit, it was a collection of experiences that bound me to my extended family and contributed to who I was becoming as I grew. Of course, not every experience from our past is happy and nurturing, but the experiences are a part of who we are becoming as we move through life. The Bible talks about God leading the people of Israel out of Egypt. Slavery and oppression in Egypt were experiences which cried out for liberation. So it is always out of Egypt. Egypt symbolized a cruel time in the people's story, but it was a time that must not be forgotten. It was also not a place to which they should ever return, so they were led 
out of Egypt. Scripture also talks about going up to Jerusalem. Since Jerusalem stands at a higher elevation than some of the surrounding terrain, it is literally up to Jerusalem. But in a symbolic sense, the people were called to go up to Jerusalem as they moved closer to God together. Our text this morning talks about Solomon's dedication of the new temple in Jerusalem. Since the people had come out of Egypt, there had been various shrines and places of worship in the land. But now the king was centralizing worship in Jerusalem and shutting down the old places of worship. He was introducing a radical innovation into the worship life of God's people. How did the out of Egypt experience connect with the call to go up to Jerusalem? Listen again to verse 16 of our text where we hear the Lord say, since the day that I brought my people Israel out of Egypt, I have not chosen a city from any of the tribes of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there, but I chose David to be over my people Israel. The author of First Kings is telling his generation and ours how the up to Jerusalem change still connected with the out of Egypt experience, the Exodus experience at the heart of God's people's identity. Sometimes when a church introduces a change, that change meets with resistance. You've undoubtedly heard that old saying, the seven last words of the church. We've never done it that way before. When Rhonda and I arrived as fresh-faced associate pastors at First Baptist of Grand Junction, Colorado, we were told that we could make changes as needed, except we were told, don't touch the youth prayer breakfast. <laughs> so once a week during the school year, I would get to the church at 5.30 in the morning and meet a church volunteer before she went into her job, and she would help prepare breakfast for an unknown number of young people before school. Ten or more years earlier, the prayer breakfast had been well attended, but by the time we got there, with fewer teens in the church, we would get just a handful, if that. It was as though the youth prayer breakfast was still stuck in Egypt. Eventually and amazingly, that breakfast became the thing to do for the college age group. And they brought us out of Egypt at last and set us on our way to Jerusalem. In centralizing worship in Israel, Solomon was shaking things up. He had to connect their past with the people's present. So he reached back into the past and he placed the Ark of the Covenant, which was a relic of the past, he placed it within the new temple, bringing the symbol of the old ways into the very heart of the new. Listen again to verses 20 and 21. Now the Lord has upheld the promise that he made, for I have risen in the place of my father David. I sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised, and have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. There I have provided a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our ancestors when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Tradition tells us that Solomon was, was very wise, but of course no leader is wise all of the time. But Solomon realized that in times of change, continuity with the past can be quite powerful. Moving the old Ark of the Covenant into the holiest place in the New Testament was a way of connecting that out of Egypt experience with the up to Jerusalem life for God's people. In our Rhode Island congregation, when we arrived there, the Sunday school was held during worship. So just as we do here, the children and teachers stayed in worship for the first third of the service, and then they were dismissed to their classes. 
and the teachers were never able to take communion or listen to the sermons, what should we do? We asked one another. We experimented with different solutions, including a very brief service before worship on Communion Sunday just for Sunday school teachers, but nothing seemed to be just the right thing for that situation. One idea that was put forward was to make Sunday school a separate time from worship. And that suggested change prompted immediate and strong resistance. If you do that, I'm quitting, said some. So together we slowed things down. We took our time and we had conversations with one another, but we made no changes. Eventually, over the course of a year, a consensus formed, and together we made that change. And after another year under that new arrangement, the same people who had threatened to quit now expressed the strongest support for the change. Somehow we had come out of Egypt and up to Jerusalem, but not in a hurry. Oftentimes the way that we work together and the way that we make important decisions as a church are as important as the actual decisions themselves. When the world looks at us and how we conduct ourselves together, they should catch a glimpse of heaven. They should see something of the reality of God. Several times our text this morning refers to Solomon's temple as a house for the name of the Lord. Solomon described the temple project in this way in verse 16. My father David had it in mind to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. A place where God's reality would be visible to the world. We know that God is everywhere present and not confined within any house of worship. But more importantly, the authentic worship and nurturing community and loving behavior of the people who meet in the house of worship are what put God's name out there for everyone to see. Solomon seems to recognize this reality when he says further down in verse 27 of that same chapter, but will God indeed dwell on the earth, even heaven, and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. And yet, here we are. Our last year of seminary, we would occasionally attend First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley, located near our apartment. The church building sat on a busy corner, and the sanctuary walls were glass on two sides at the ground level from floor to ceiling. And I remember one Sunday looking out the glass wall of the sanctuary just as a young man was walking by on the sidewalk. He was looking down, seemingly lost in thought. Suddenly he casually looked in the direction of the church and what he saw made him do a double take. He momentarily stopped in his tracks. The sight of God's people at worship had grabbed his attention, if only for a moment. Every church is called to be a house for the name of the Lord. We are called to be the evidence of God's loving reality in our world. This happens by the way that we treat each other, and this happens by the way that we care for our neighbors. Jesus put it this way in Matthew chapter 5, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hid. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all the house. May we be a house for the name of the Lord this week. Amen.